Don't worry, folks. There's still time to pick a college champion and get the best odds in the country. Do some prop swapping with us. Go to PropSwap.com, where America buys and sells sports bets. And the NFL's version of April Madness is here. Kevin Bowen, Chris Presley back in studio. Another edition of Kevin's Corner. Chris, you, you care if I call you Christopher? That's fine. Christopher, we are three weeks away from the NFL draft. Isn't that awesome? I mean, this it's... This offseason's uh, kind of flying by, right? Dude, it's like, this is my favorite week of the year sports-wise. And then after this, I feel like really the cycle or the NBA, not the NBA calendar, the sports calendar kind of shifts towards the draft. Yeah. Um, you know, the NBA, it's not as playoff-centric in mid-April as it usually is. Major League Baseball still getting underway. But, man, we uh, we really get into the draft. And uh, Beers with Bowen will be three weeks from Wednesday. So that is April 28th, 8 p.m. Again, that'll be virtual. And then the draft, the 29th, 30th, and May 1st. So as we tease, as we promised, a lot of draft content coming your way over the next few weeks on Kevin's Corner. We'll hit you with a positional mock draft today, get into some more prospects on next week's pod and the one after that as well. And then an always fun beers with Bowen coming on the 28th. How, uh, how'd how your bracket end up, man? I finished second. I did have Baylor winning did it you? all. Yep. Wow, nice. Had you ba- had Baylor over Gonzaga? I had Baylor over Gonzaga. Uh, you know what you're talking about. What a game. That Dude, Baylor team, man. Baylor is, um, those dudes made, if I were Gonzaga, I was sweating every time Gonzaga dribbled. Yeah. I was like, oh, I'm. I feel nervous for them. <laughs> I mean, it's just their speed. They just their intensity. They've got grown men. They've got dudes that I think could play on Sundays. <laughs> Some of those guys look mm-hmm. like they go play in the NFL. And um, what an effort! As much as I think Scott Drew is shady, that that was a. Um, it's one of the best Final Four performances ever. Ever like Final Four semifinal game championship yeah. game. I mean, they just thoroughly beat down a number two seed and then. An undefeated team. I had Gonzaga, but after Saturday night, I, I was saying my head says Baylor, my heart says Gonzaga. Kind yeah. of got a soft spot, I guess, a little bit for Mark Few's bunch. But um, we did want to mention, you know, Prop Swap sponsored Kevin's Corner. Someone got Prop Swap a, um, a bet before Monday night, before the title game tipped off at 9, whatever it was. Plus 193 they got Baylor. Wow. Those odds. <laughs> You know full well. I mean, yeah. you were, it was like plus 160 yeah. before the game started. That was a $14,000 ticket, which paid out forty one grand. <laughs> so we talk about prop swap a lot. Best odds in the country. That is their big thing with the Masters this week. Certainly stay glued to that. Download their app. Um, head to propswap.com. The best odds in the country. Buy or sell. Right. And uh, you can obviously hedge a little bit in the selling category and then you know, if you think whatever Xander Shoffley is going to win, don't wait till Sunday. Um, if you do wait till Sunday, go to Prop Swap if you really want to get the best odds in the country, uh, because they provide that for you. So uh, thank you to them for um, sponsoring Met Luke Pergandy this week and uh, and Ian Epstein as well. They're two owners. They came in town, so fun to uh, catch up with them, man. So uh, you have a Masters pick? I don't. I'm not a I'm not a golf guy, as you know. I'll watch the Masters. Um, mm-hmm. It's one of those things that, on a nice set. So say the Saturday, say it's like 75 or whatever. Yeah. You you do a little spring cleaning. You prop the windows open. You lay on the couch. You watch the Masters. Yeah. Give me some birds chirping. You get a little nap in. You wake up. You're watching good golf, and and that's that's about the extent of the Masters okay. watching that I have. Uh, my heart says Tony Finau. My head says that's an idiotic pick. I'd love to see him win it. I'll go with I'll go with Anthony Fee now. Okay, getting the green jacket from Dustin Johnson. Now the nice part about golf when it comes to betting, the return on investments a lot better than than most other sports. Tremendous, tremendous, and that again was where prop swap for golf really moving forward and some NFL draft bets. I know Stan Caller guy was tweeting at us about he's got a uh, parlay for the first five picks, and we'll hit on a lot of that. Between now and April 29th, last year, we got very fortunate to predict the Michael Pittman pick. Hopefully, we can find some luck again with number 21 overall. But uh, let's do the positional mock. Now. Yeah, let's jump into that. Uh, you mentioned Stan. He's trying to pick the the first five in order. Yeah. We'll get into a little bit more of that in Twitter questions after the news yesterday with Sam Darnold moving to Carolina. But the Colts' first round pick. What do you What do you see their biggest positional need as, as we go through these seven rounds? 
Yeah, and exactly. That's exactly what this positional mock is all about. Right here, right now, the morning of April 6th, what are the biggest needs for the Colts in order? And we should mention, Chris, just six picks right now. So spreading out those yeah. needs aren't as abundant as we've had at this point of the offseason in years past. I still think round one was left tackle. Um, I'm a lot closer to edge rusher, but if you're talking about like how you can kind of patchwork some things together, your internal options right now, we'll see what happens with Justin Houston. You know, as free agency continues to play out, I tend to think left tackle in the immediacy and in the next handful of years is the more important need because I think offensively, you're so built around that offensive line. Yeah. You you really just don't have this dynamic, dynamic pass-catching group or even quarterback to where you can hide some things on the O-line. Flat out. You just need your O-line to be elite. And that's where I put left tackle still atop that list. Obviously, the good news is it kind of falls in line with some of this depth. You know, I know a lot of people love Christian Darisau out of Virginia Tech. I'm probably cooling on him a little bit more. There are some other guys that I kind of like that we'll get into on, on, on future pods that could fall into that area. But for me, man, and obviously what's happened in free agency, yeah, you know, I, I still look at all these all offensive linemen signed. While I commend Chris Ballard for building some depth and building more competition than he did last offseason, I want to keep Quentin Nelson where he's at. I want to keep Braden Smith where he's at, and I want to go find the next Anthony Costanzo. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice that the, this left tackle group is so deep this year. It might be the deepest position in the draft. Might be. Um, now I know finding ready-made offensive tackles from the college game to the pro game isn't 100% mm-hmm. something that is there, but you can find the right right guys. And, I mean, we we, we saw it last year. Hell, look at, the, um, look at the Super Bowl team. Jedrick Wills came in and – or not Jedrick Willis, he went to Cleveland. Um, Tristan Wirfs came in and played great football yeah. for Tampa Bay. So um, those guys went a little bit higher than the Colts, but still at 21, I think you can find somebody. All right, left tackle one. So now we're into round two. What's that? What's our second biggest positional need? And, you know, obviously you got to throw in here the whole trade down impact mm-hmm. of just where this could look different. Um, I'd be very surprised if the Colts were to trade down before Thursday night unfolds. On April 29th, but for me, it, it, it's a no-brainer, and that's edge rusher. Yeah, um, and I want to make this very, very clear: just because you've missed at this position, Chris, does not mean you stop swing, stop swinging. Yeah. No, I mean, I guess Masters Week. You might as well use the golf analogy. We're not putting the driver in the bag just because we've missed a few fairways. Like we don't need to take out the three wood. No, no, no. You, this is a golf outing. You keep swinging the driver. And you keep swinging for the fences because that position means so much to every team in the NFL. But I honestly think it means more to the Colts. And I know when you talk to Matt Eberflus, he'll say, three technique, will linebacker, nickel slot corner. Those three are the triangle, the hot spots in his defense. I'd argue edge rusher deserves to be right up there, if not higher, because for me in defending the pass in the NFL – It comes down to how do you disrupt timing. You can disrupt it with pressure up front. You can disrupt it with coverage on the back end. When your coverage is going to be primarily zone and not a lot of press, the Colts press occasionally, but, you know, they they don't press as much as other teams. That eliminates that early disruption on the back end. Mm -hmm. So how do you make up for that? You rely on your front. And when you're going to rush four and drop seven, which is what they want to do a whole lot, that puts even more of an onus on the front four, those individuals up there, to get home. So um, I can listen to arguments about edge rusher in round one. I don't know if the value necessarily matches up with pick 21. I mean, there's a – you're going to find people, and and I've heard from a lot of you, you're going to find people really on both sides of the fence with – you know, Phillips and Rousseau and uh, Quiddy Pay and Jason Owe. I mean, a lot of these, um, the kid from Texas, I mean, they, they, a lot of them, you're going to find people that will say 100% pull the trigger and no shot. Mm-hmm. They aren't even on my board. That type of, you know, stark contrast there. Um, but again, 
you keep swinging. Just, you know, a miss with Basham, you know, uh, right now it's a miss with Banigou, still up in the air on, on Ture. You have to keep on going. And look at, you know, the deals that you've signed. It's like Al-Qadim Muhammad, one-year deal. Isaac Rochelle, one-year deal. I can't imagine Justin Houston, if he came back here, would be for more than a one-year mm -hmm. You know, to me, Tyquan Lewis is better served in the interior. I, I don't maybe he's out there early downs, but I kind of like Tyquan Lewis more in the interior as a rotational guy in there, Chris. So, um, yeah, edge rush, right there at uh, whatever that is, pick fifty something. Right? So, was saying that about the edge, and then us mentioning how deep this left tackle core could be coming out in this draft. How surprised would you be if those two get flipped? If we go D in first and then left tackle second. Uh, <sighs> Kind of surprised. I mean, not 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 overly surprised, but a little bit. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, you go to sleep Thursday night and you're saying, "Oh boy, is that starting left?" Now, if that happens, and you know, we'll have an emergency podcast Thursday night after round one. I mean, to me, is that an indication that Quentin Nelson or Braden Smith is your left tackle? Yeah, that would be my first thought. To be to be honest with you. So I, I would not be – I'd be somewhat surprised, but not like, oh, my gosh, you know, Jalen Suggs is jumping on a scores table surprise. You know, it wouldn't be to that extent. It's not your Philip Dorsett signing or your Philip no. Dorsett draft. Oh, oh, boy, <laughs> gosh. Yeah, you talk about sweating. Now, now I'm sweating again. Um, no, definitely not that. How about – did you see the Zach Kiefer article this week? No. He wrote uh, basically like all the guys that Colts could have drafted. That's like, a – if you had the perfect draft, is there any more like just right. stick a knife in the back of a fan base, you know? And then the Pacers say it all the time. Obviously, it's like could have had OG and Anobi, you know, who'd you draft instead of Aaron Kawhi Holiday. Leonard. You know, right, yeah. right, right. Hell could have had Michael. Um, if you want to go way back. So, yeah, it's um, let's not play that game too much. <laughs> yeah. Colts don't have a third round pick. That goes to Philly in the Carson Wentz deal. So now we jumped to round four. Obviously, third round pick still very valuable. With that decline from second to four, who do you see going in the fourth round? You know, it, it's interesting, Chris, because I feel like that big of a gap. If you also looked on the need list, there also is, you know, a pretty good sized gap. It's true. From you know one one a to, um, I guess three on that list, and I have tight end. Um. You could maybe just say pass catcher in general, but I think tight end specifically. You know, Jack Doyle will be 31 here in May. I think it's a contract year for Doyle. Um, I'd have to double check and look that up. But um, doesn't it kind of suck? Like you get to our age and that's old in, in sports. <laughs> right? It's like, oh, he's 31. It's like, oh hell, I'm 30. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I know. I mean, we are getting to the point now where it's like, oh gosh, like everyone on the Colts roster is about to be younger than me. Yeah. Um, oh, Jack Doyle's got two more years left, 20, 2021 and 2022. Yeah, he signed that extension in December um, of the uh, of the 2019 season. So 2020, 2021, and 2022 were the three new years on that. Um, having said that, again, you know, considering Doyle's age, I, I, I still and how big tight end is in this offense, yeah. I think it's it's a certain need for sure. I kind of want the basketball type, you know, more of that slender body, more of that receiving threat. You know, I think Carson Wentz, I've mentioned before, is a great seam thrower of the football. So that's where I like involving a tight end a little bit more vertically. So, yeah, early day three, Chris, uh, let's go tight end. Okay. Round five. So we have left tackle, defensive end, and tight end already off the board. Do we revisit any of those positions or do you go somewhere else? I'm going to go somewhere else. I guess for the last three picks. Okay. Um, round five, I'll go corner back. I always think you should draft a corner. I think in today's day and age, you know, as long as you have whatever, you know, at least six or seven picks, you draft a corner every year. I just think that position means a lot in today's NFL. You know, last year you drafted a corner who I'm intrigued by defensively in Isaiah Rogers. You know, part of me thinks Isaiah was really drafted, you know, for his kick return ability. This year, I think it's, you know, round five, you can get even more of a corner that is built for this defense a little bit. That makes some sense to me. Yeah, I think we have to acknowledge Xavier Rhodes. It is a one-year deal. Mm -hmm. You know, he does turn 31 here in a couple months. Um, so I like corner there in round five. 
All right, moving on to round six. What do we got? Yeah, I'm going to go wide out here. Uh, you know, day three wideouts haven't been super kind to the Colts, but, you know, I go back to what I said, man. Hilton, one year deal. Um, he certainly is not really an out retirement <laughs> based off his comments. And there's mm-hmm. an article up on 107.5 The Fan. If you um, if you missed that, some of his comments last week about that, you got to acknowledge Paris Campbell and the injury situation. I believe Zach Paschal will be unre- – assuming he re signs the restricted free agent tender, he would be a res- unrestricted next year. So, again, that's something you just have to acknowledge as well. Um, so, yeah, let's go wide out in round six. You know, I mentioned the blueprint free agency. I still kind of like a middle tier wide receiver there. We haven't seen that yet to go along with Hilton right. in the re-signing. Um, but, yeah, let's uh, let's uh, dip into the wide out market. And rounding things out in round seven, what do we got? So I was a little bit torn here. You know, I thought about linebacker, but I think to myself, man, you've drafted so many linebackers we haven't really seen yet. EJ Speed, Zaire Franklin, Matthew Adams, mm-hmm. Glasgow. Now, you know, was Glasgow drafted for special teams? Yes, but whatever. He is a linebacker. I also think, you know, as much as I say draft a running back every year, you really got no room. Go find an undrafted running back, and what, are you going to carry five running backs? Are you going to cut Jordan Wilkins? You just don't have room. Uh, So I'm going to go safety. Now, to your earlier point, Chris, I'm glad you brought that up. Are you going to double dip at any position? Maybe O-line. But you've done a whole lot in free agency at O-line, and I think defensive tackle you feel pretty good about as well. So I'll go safety. Involving that third safety in sub packages, something that they did not do last season. The dime group that we talked about was not used as well. Um, did you see? I you probably didn't, but this this is the the job I have. So the Colts signed Sean Davis, that safety from the Steelers. Correct. Pull up Sean Davis on Instagram for me, okay? <laughs> okay. And check out his most recent picture. Um, you know, it sounds like a guy that is going to play special teams and, you know, has some starting experience before for the Steelers. And what is he with Washington maybe for, for a cup of tea? I texted Joey Molinaro about him. He's like, yeah, he's just a guy, you know, insurance for Minka Fitzpatrick. And that was really it. So, you know, Chris Bauer has liked to have a veteran safety in the building. And I think Sean Davis is a bit like that. And then obviously he's played a whole lot of special teams. You're talking about the wedding photo? Yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. Can you describe it for our audience out there? <laughs> All right. There's a jungle setting. You have Mr. Davis and his lovely bride sitting on. Beautiful a, couple. S- sitting on a rock. Directly in front of them is a tiger. <laughs> and, and not woods. But, yeah. I mean, we're talking like live like uh hangover tiger this is an actual yes this yeah. is an actual tiger might could be mike tyson's as you mentioned yeah large wow um good for the davis fan i mean and the tiger's close you know there's certain things that when you become a professional athlete or you get a certain amount of money you just get get to do because you can do it this is one of those things like yeah. i would never in a million years think you know what let's put a tiger in front of us you know right when you and maddie got married you're not putting a tiger at, no, at your wedding. No, no jungle cats were uh, at Butler when we took pictures. Oh, my over God. There. No, I can't say that was in uh, part of the photog card. Um, I've always thought this, Chris. To play safety, to play special teams, you got to be a little crazy. Mm-hmm. Little boy. I mean, that, you know, <laughs> say no more about that picture. So, getting back to where we're at, <laughs> round seven, why not draft another safety? Now, maybe is this George Odom dependent? We'll see how that situation plays out. But, you know, no Tavon Wilson. He mm-hmm. left. We'll see where Roland Milligan is coming back from the opt-out. But I just think it's good to involve another safety there. Yeah, and that's why I asked you about the double dip at offensive linemen. But even though the Colts' Twitter especially, they're not too thrilled with, why are we getting these pieces and not making a splash? Chris Ballard has addressed the offensive line fairly well with guys that have played meaningful snaps in the NFL. And then you have the Danny Pinter, Will Holden holdovers mm-hmm. from last year. Uh, now, and Joey Hunt, I should mention Joey Hunt was a re-signing. We've talked about him before. Um, so, yeah, Chris, I, I I guess, did any position stand out to you? I mean, you, you thought maybe double dip on O-line? I thought we possibly could. I didn't know if we would go, you know, maybe double dip on defensive end. Just those those yeah, key needs. Um, tight end that early, I like. 
it's I I didn't know if you were going to throw one in there or not. So having one in round four, which I think you can still get a very uh, high production out of a tight end. I mean, George Kittle was where? Yeah. You know, Waller was where? I right. mean, these guys weren't, you know, Kyle Pitts going high. Those guys fall. So so the fact that you took tight end and cornerback where you know that those guys can fall to, yes, you have these stud corners that come out. You know them by name. They live up to expectations. But there's also a lot of guys that make a good career and living in the NFL that you've never heard of that played at these smaller schools. Right. But once they get to the NFL, they transition well outside the numbers. And I'll be honest with you. The drop from tight end to corner, in my mind, is, is rather significant. Like, I, I think there's a – I was pretty steadfast on tight end being that third need here, the fourth-round pick, with the Colts not having that third-rounder. So, I'm curious your guys' thoughts on that. Um, you know, this, this might sound crazy, Chris, and I hate doing it, but if the right kicker was there in round seven, I'd probably draft him. Really, I know that's aggressive, but I think you need to create some competition okay. for for Blankenship. Um, if you're going to show me Rodrigo Blankenship's rookie season and say, "Would you sign up for it?" Probably would have. You can, I mean, oftentimes the rookie kickers, it can go the wrong way, mm-hmm. and you know, rookie kickers obviously can make a jump, but I think we have to acknowledge some short misses and some critical moments, the opener and then the playoff game. And then we just didn't see a whole lot of long kicks. And when we did, we saw some shaky moments. Yeah. So I, I, I just think, you know, in all likelihood, it's probably more of an undrafted kicker. But I think you need to have a kicking competition come whatever training camp. So I know a lot of people are enamored with Rex Specs. And, I mean, he just seems like a hilarious dude and all that. Um, but, you know, we are trying to win a lot of football games. Yeah. So. Um, I think you got to do that. And before we jump into Twitter questions, something I heard you guys mention this morning on on the morning show here locally, and Indy was uh, talking about just back to the kicker, Aaron Rodgers getting trolled last night on Jeopardy. Oh, how about that? <laughs> That's awesome. How great was that? That is awesome. What I love in sports, I love funny fans. Um, hilarious moment in Jeopardy last night. You guys have all seen the video by now, I'm sure. And then how about the Angels-Astros game? The Angels fans blowing up the inflatable yep. trash can, throwing it on the field. You know what? The Colts' 12th man's in the ring of honor. The Angels, <laughs> what is it, 10th man, I guess? You yeah. play with nine on the field. That and the rally monkey for the Angels should go up in their ring of honor. Would it be 11 since they have a DH? Oh, good point. I was thinking just the field. Yeah, I forgot about the AL. Uh, boy, I sound like such an NL fan. <laughs> um yeah, okay, okay, fair. Yeah, you're right. Um, so, yeah, Mike Trout, Vlad Guerrero, I don't know any – Nolan Ryan, I don't know any other Angels. Mike Sosha, I don't know who else we're throwing up there. But let's get them up there after that effort. Love it. Well, that was the potential mock breakdown. As Kevin mentioned, let us know in the comments what you think regarding those positions or if there's anything you felt like we missed out on, let us know. Let's jump to Twitter questions. Let's do it. First one's coming from Daniel. Thanks you for the great podcast and keep up the great work. Thanks, Daniel. Now that Sam Darnold has been traded and knowing what the Panthers gave up for him, would you have preferred the Colts still get Wentz or Darnold? Darnold didn't cost as much in the draft capital, and he's still on his rookie deal, but he doesn't have the history or relationship with Frank Reich. Yeah, Daniel, I, we got a couple of these late, late last night, Chris. I think Ross also threw, threw one in there. Um let me start here. You know, when I did my QB rankings of realistic candidates, you know, I had Derek Carr one with the caveat of how realistic is he. I had Carson Wentz two, and I had Sam Darnold three with with a a gap mm-hmm. between two and three. Um, and you know me, I'm not that caught up in compensation. I'm not like uh, just get it right. You know, I um now let's let's look at those both. I mean, a second, a fourth, and a sixth for Darnold on a rookie contract and a first and a third on Wentz on a bigger contract, clearly, that's a wide difference in value. Yeah. I mean, and that's an indicator of how I view those two QBs, to be honest with you. Exactly. I get it, Darnold, higher ceiling because he's younger, but I think Daniel brings up a great point. The history with Reich, I think, is really important here. You, you, You can't ignore that. You know, Sam Darnold doesn't have that history. 
Um, boy, Carolina, what do we like? The Teddy Bridgewater thing was that just a waste? Yeah, I was. I didn't pick. You know, Panthers never came to the front of my mind when I thought where might Darnold go. Yeah, it seems like their owner Tepper is like super enamored with the franchise QB, and obviously this is an indicator that they don't feel comfortable with the fourth quarterback in the draft slash probably don't want to trade up because now it's when does that fourth QB go right and that's even I, we all thought Carolina I think at at eight, eight overall would trade up or maybe they just get the guy at number eight overall now it's I mean is it New England screaming up to take Justin Fields is you know what I mean that's that's gonna be fascinating Atlanta's sitting there at four and I, yeah, I don't think you can totally rule that out but um that'll be really interesting to me, and obviously San Francisco just flat out beat him to the punch, right. you know, getting all the way up there to number three overall. So, Daniel, if you're going to give me those, uh, again, I still think Wentz has the higher ceiling here in Indianapolis. And, you know, Sam Darnold has never played a meaningful NFL game. Like, sure, I guess your first game as a rookie is important, but, like, look at where the Jets' record has been mm-hmm. entering the month of December. Yeah. This dude has not been in one pressure packed, holy smokes, we're eight and six, they're eight and six, and we got to win to control our fit, whatever. Like, I'm just not, no. And you got to factor in the whole Reich element. So I know it's more capital, I know it's a bigger cap hit, but you guys know me. Just, just get the QB right. I, I don't, you could, you know, give him the Salesforce Tower or tell him to go live in the varsity villas in Bloomington. Just get it right. Yeah. Next question comes from Big Bama. If the Colts target a wide receiver in the draft, do you think they will look for a receiver who is a red zone threat with the ability to get separation as well as Terrence Marshall type? Outside of Michael Pittman, the Colts don't have many guys that can go get that 50-50 ball. Also, if you were to announce the Colts pick in the draft, would you do it Reggie Wayne style or would you go the Pat McAfee route? (laughs) Well, you know, let me go here, Chris. Uh, big Bama. I think of that big Alabama guard they had this year. Last name Brown. Do you, do you remember? I mean, that dude. Yeah, massive. I mean, yeah. He looked like he's, you know, eating some good Southern cooking right. this day. So when I hear Big Bama, that's how I, who I picture. <laughs> um, let's Before we go with the McAfee Wayne. Wow, that's wild. I don't. Yeah, that's a, interesting. Good question. Um, You know, I. When I look at the wideout group, I think Paris Campbell's your biggest worry. Health. So I would probably want to mirror that skill set. Okay. You know, I, I understand what you're saying here with the whole Pittman 50-50. But I also think, like, who can separate? That ultimately is the question at wideout. Who can separate? And you can find different body types. Tyreek Hill can separate. True. Stephon Diggs can separate. Obviously, Julio Jones can separate. You know, Tyler Lockett can can, can separate. And then you look at his own depth chart, DK Metcalf can separate a bit. Um, obviously, bigger body, you can create more of a catch radius than the little guys can. But that's what it comes down to for me. So, I understand where you're coming from here. Um, and maybe it's a little bit of mix of those two, a little bit of speed and a little bit of size as well. Um, I, I don't think Terrence Marshall... I don't know if he tested like great, great. Maybe it was arm length that kind of stood out to me. But um, so yeah, that is um, I, I'd probably side with the Campbell skill set there. Um, Going with a body type like that, you think Patman has any chance to dress this year? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I really want to see training camp for him. You know, he he obviously didn't play on special teams last year, you know, how much of that was just a numbers game, how much of that was just he doesn't play special teams. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a fair question you have to ask. And then do you get a little bit too niche on game day? Like, let's start thinking about wideouts you're dressing. Okay, you're dressing Hilton, you're dressing Campbell, you're dressing Pittman, you're dressing Pascal, are you dressing DeMichael Harris? Are you dressing Ashton Doolin? Mm -hmm. Uh, Patman, obviously. So... Uh, Reese Fountain, I mean, you know, it's that's where you get into. N- nice problem to have, but um, I do think oftentimes when you get fifth wide out, you get a little bit more special teamy than, you know, Marcus Johnson dressing because he's an effective wide out. Um, Wayne McAfee. So Wayne was subdued but had the zinger. 
Oh, it was still funny, yeah. Right, but I mean, like, not, I mean, McAfee was like, you know, yeah. McAfee, you know, Hall of Famer, right. Bobby Okari. I, I'd probably be a mix. Like, I yell at sporting events on my TV. <laughs> I mean, I, I the Jalen Sugg shot, I yelled, and it was loud, and it felt good to get it out. But, um... <laughs> I yelled, so it, it would be a mix. Um, yeah, probably a little bit more Wayne-like, though. I mean, that's a lot of people to be truly yelling in front of. Mm-hmm. I kind of like to yell in front of my own crew. Um, you like to know your surroundings. When yeah, you're I don't. You know, I just don't want to be. Uh, <laughs> yeah, who the hell is that kind of thing? Right. But uh, but yeah, I, I'd say a little bit more Wayne. All right, we're going to go to a question from David who says, seeing how Ben Banigou and the drafting of Ben Banigou 2.0 will be making meaningful snaps this year, what's the over-under of sacks this year by the Colts on the season? I'm, but I believe he's referring to, to Ben here. I'd say eight and a half, better take the under, but in all seriousness, is the edge rush not something that's important in the NFL or, is it, or that's important to an NFL team or is it just me? Yeah, I guess, yeah, the eight and a half sacks. I mean, yeah, I mean, Ben Banigo, I'd probably take the under there. Boy, that was a lot of, I feel like there's a lot of snark in that question. Um, I don't know about you. So, I mean, edge rush and pressure in general, I, I think it's very important to NFL teams. And like I was saying earlier, I think it should be even more important to the Colts. Um, I don't know, the drafting of Ben Banigo 2.0, okay? So I guess they're saying you're going to draft an edge rusher again this year. Um, you know, the Colts had decent sack numbers last season. It's more the pressure. That's yeah. what it really boils down to for me. Another great name here, Pumpkin Pastry. Ballard has such an affinity for drafting players with high levels of measurables and athletic traits. After reviewing his draft history at the corner position, why does he go away from this concept? Wilson and Rakicin both measure fairly poorly compared to, to their peers. Does it have to do with the zone versus man-to-man? Wow, that's an interesting question and, and some good research there. Um, it is a good point. You know, obviously Ro- Isaiah Rogers himself fits it from a speed standpoint, a little bit slender on the frame, but makes up for it. Um, I do think it has a lot to do with scheme. You know, Chris, I feel like if you're going to kind of narrow down two major traits the Colts will have at corner, it'd be ball production, finding the ball, and it'd be um, high-level tackler. And I feel like the Colts are very sound with their corner group in the tackling department. Yeah. Um, so I do think that is something, you know, that 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 goes there. Dude, every time I hear Quincy Wilson drafted, I just think to myself, why the hell did Ursa keep Pagano for one more year? <laughs> you know? And, like, I mean that in all seriousness. Like, it just, it just stunt. Like, why? It's a totally different scheme. Chris was clearly enamored with wanting to be in a 4-3. Indoors, yeah, and um, yeah, I just don't, man. I just do not get that. It's just such a, it's almost like a waste of a year for the franchise. And look at look at the draft picks, you know, Hooker and, and Basham and, and Banner and and like not all of that. Am I just flat out blaming on Pagano? I mean, there were some Ballard misses in there, and Ballard should have been selfish in that draft and been like, all right, I I get it, but I'm not drafting to your scheme. I'm drafting mm-hmm. big big picture. But I just, God, that was like such an emotional decision. By Ursa, to be honest with you, there. Um, yeah, I mean, pumpkin pastry, which sounds, I don't know, it sounds kind of good. It does sound know, good. Maybe in the fall. Um, yeah, it, it it's it's a little bit different in like the high, high level athleticism traits, but I do think it's more scheme dependent. Mm-hmm. We're going to stay with edge rush, which will be a common theme for a lot of the questions this week. Um, this one's from Evan. Hey, Kev. Was thinking about edge rush issues for the Colts and was Cheeks wondering. Cheeks Evan or different Evan? Different Evan. Oh, okay. Saw Cheeks last night. Cheeks is doing well, ladies yeah, and gentlemen. Yeah, he's doing great, man. It was good to see him. Shout out to the Mucky Duck on the south side. Awesome patio. Says, uh, I was thinking about edge rush issue for the Colts and wondering how much optimism you have for some contract year magic from Kamoko Ture or Taekwon Lewis. <laughs> I know you probably won't be counting on it, but the season. The seasons like Trey Hendrickson, D. Ford, and Dante Fowler all had in their contract years come to mind and give me some cautious hope. Once again, thanks for doing the pod, and congrats on your new sponsor. Thank you. Appreciate that, Evan. Yeah, shout out to Prop Swap, um, and thank you for sponsoring Kevin's Corner. Um, yeah, that's it. Wow. Chris, I like this outside-the-box thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, I am. 
I I do believe in the power of a contract you. Oh yeah. Um for sure. You know, really with with Ture, man, it just comes down to health. Like that's the thing for me. It's just can he stay healthy? Um he's really a specialized player. He is the third down player, which is fine. Um but man, you you got to be healthy. You know, you got to have those traits full go and ready to get after the quarterback and, and bring that speed element. I thought Tyquan Lewis showed pretty good signs last season. You know, kind of an early contract year for him. And as Chris Ballard says often, you know, kind of takes three to four years with edge rusher. So a guy like Hendrickson, Romeo Cora, you know, those guys, Carl Lawson even, those guys really kind of emerge late in the mm-hmm. rookie contract. So, um, you know, believing in the power of a contract year is great, Evan, but I would love to have the insurance of making a move in free agency. And you guys have heard that uh, from me a lot here in the last few weeks, and I will continue to uh, pound the table for that. Um, but, man, you hope the mighty dollar and dangling that carrot mm-hmm. wins out, but then, of course, <laughs> then you resign the guys, and do you have the same problem <laughs> for the next yeah. you know, three years? It's not like every year can be a contract year from a motivation standpoint. Going out to our good friend Gary, who – Seems to be almost a weekly contributor yeah. to the pod. Says for the past several seasons, he's heard the phrase, this is a locker room guy, or the Colts have a great locker room, or something along the lines of that player's not a shoe guy. As he watches teams like the Patriots and the Bucks with Antonio Brown and Indomitian Sue win Super Bowls, in your opinion, is there a balance? Does having the most Walter Payton man of the years get us a Lombardi, or are the Colts locker room and that pendulum too far to one end of the spectrum or can we win with all these quote-unquote nice guys? Don't get me wrong. I'm all about high character, but you can't mix in a few outliers if it's going to get you over the hump to the Super Bowl. You know how I feel about you and Chris in the pod. It would be my desert island pod for sure. Thanks. Great content and go Colts. Wow. Man, that's a g- desert island pod. That's a nice compliment. Appreciate that. Jeez. I like that. Um just got a text. This one cup can help you lose 32 pounds immensely. Have a cup before sleeping. Should You think I should do it? Should I click on the link? I don't think you need to lose 32 pounds, Kevin. I do. I got my little <laughs> brother-in-law's wedding coming up. and Man, I'm a little nervous. So I'm going to fit into the old uh, <laughs> the old tux. And it's only been a few weeks. But, um, boy, Easter whew, really got the best of me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Gary, yeah, you, you got to have a balance. And, you know, Ballard, for what it's worth, he said that he's open to finding that doesn't check every you know horseshoe check mark, but locker room's good enough to bring that guy in. But we just haven't seen it happen. Mm-hmm. You know, the last two off seasons we haven't seen it. So um, I'll say this: I get where Chris comes from and really stressing the high character in the draft. You know, his big thing is this: Chris Presley has the high character and has decent athletic traits. Kevin Bowen has low character, but has better athletic traits. You have a better chance to reach a higher ceiling and to stay consistent longer than I do. I'm the more risky situation here. And oftentimes, you know, the lower character guy, you might think he's got high potential, but the odds of him reaching that high potential are a lot lower than the high character guy obviously has. So um, I do hear that. And I also think, and I don't know, watching Baylor last night, I just felt like they were so freaking accountable to each other. Like every single play, when they screwed up or Gonzaga got a bucket at the rim, it was immediately like, we're all communicating together. Mm -hmm. We're all going to get this figured out real quick. Um, I still think about this clip. I don't know if you um, – yeah, you, you you were watching the whole game. Baylor's up 15 late. Macy O.T. comes flying to save a ball into the Gonzaga bench. Then he busts his ass to yeah. the opposite corner, closes out on – I think it was Nemhard, and he misses a three. And I'm like, dude, that is effort. Like, if you're a high school basketball coach, you are clipping that out right yes. then and there, and you're showing that. And look, I don't know. I'm not going to act like I'm going to know the character of these Baylor guys, but I they got some dog in them. D A W G. I mean, they've got they've got a swagger that they just play to a level and hold each other to that level. And that to me is like 
I think you need that in mm-hmm. your locker room a little bit. Can you get some dog in there where, I don't know, maybe the guy likes to go to Broad Ripple or downtown or, you know, who knows, a little bit more frequently than you would like. But if on Sundays and even when he's clocking in and clocking out, if he can hold some people accountable and bring you a little swagger to you, I'm good with it. That's fair. All right, we got a long one, but a good one here from John. It says, I've heard the narrative recently that we are a worse football team now than we were at the end of the season, and the main evidence provided comes from the day one starters that we've lost. It says, I feel like that's a very misleading narrative because from 2019 to the 20 season, we lost gathers, and he was a day one starter for us, but we found an, but we found the answer already in Kari Willis. Julian Blackman has replaced Hooker, Bobby Okariki replacing Anthony Walker, Carson Wentz over Phillip Rivers, and Kamoko Turi would likely have started over Danico Autry if he was 100% in his opinion. The only positions of notable downgrade are defensive end and left tackle, which are probably pinned for the first two picks in the draft if Ballard were to hit home runs year in and year out. The biggest part of it all is if Wentz is any kind of significant upgrade over Rivers, this roster is actually better than it was in 2020. So my question is why are people panicking over not replacing rotational pieces when we know that Ballard will add at least six contributors in a month? Okay, John, there's a lot there to unpack. Um, Well, Kamoko Turi, let's start there. He would definitely not start over Danico Autry. Autry would 100% start on rundowns over Turi, even though they kind of play different positions as well. I guess, man, there's a lot there, Chris. Um, To me, I keep on coming back to this. I just think you've put too much pressure on the draft. I mean, John's saying at least six contributors in a month. You only got six picks. <laughs> the round seven guy's going to come in here and contribute from day one. That's a lot of pressure. Mm-hmm. Like I, that just doesn't happen. Like as much as every draft you feel like it could be Michael Pittman, Jonathan Taylor, it could be Rocky Sane and Ben Banigal. Chris has drafted really well, but that's a whole lot of pressure that John's putting out there. And, you know, what he says, why are people panicking over not replacing rotational pieces? Anthony Costanzo ain't a, a, a rotational piece. Mm-hmm. That dude is a flat-out cornerstone, yeah. and he just does not get replaced that easily. So I think, John, what you got to look at is, like, you've referenced some day one. Clayton Gathers. Boy, Clayton Gathers seemed like he didn't play. It seemed like it was eons ago. Right. He played for the Colts. Um, that – early defensive roster that kind of Ballard rebuilt. You know, that was kind of a 4 and 12 team that first year. And then obviously you go 10 and 6, go 7 and 9, last year you're 11 and 5. Now it's kind of that next step. It's it's the incremental steps that you take. You rebuilt bottom level talent, quote unquote, with better talent. Now that talent has gotten you to be you're the 7th seed in the AFC last year, you're just behind um, Tennessee and winning that division. Now it's okay. How do you get to that seven seed becomes a three seed, and now you're winning the AFC South. That's where it's okay. Does does the roster need a tweak again? Um, some nice draft hits certainly, but boy, it's absurd. And it's it would be a it'd be a slap in the face at Chris Ballard to act like Chris Ballard just falls out of bed and hits on these draft picks year in and year out. There's a whole lot of work. Yeah, Chris would be the first guy to tell you that. Like, it just doesn't happen year in and year out. And if you look at the drafts, it, it, it hasn't happened. Again, you've had great success in 2018, great success in 2020, 2019 much more up in the air, and 2017 with some circumstances factoring in there, um, you know, obviously didn't work out there. So, boy, six contributions. To have those expectations in the draft, that is – that's like me sitting here being like, yeah, Tiger Woods is going to win four majors next year. <laughs> I, I think you, if you could sign up for two to three day one starters out of this draft, you'd mm-hmm. say, where do I sign up? Especially yeah. when you only have two picks in the first hundred. Yeah, and a shout out to the Colts production team. I'm sure all of our listeners have seen already, but with the next pick that that docu, well, I guess a short kind of docu series yeah. has come out. Their their first episodes out, and I love watching those steps that those guys go through. Must watch, man. I'm glad you brought that up. Shout out to Chris McGeha and Mike DeReese, two awesome dudes that they um, featured. I guess would be mm-hmm. the right word in that first episode. So yeah, that's a just an awesome series. Yeah, I 
don't take that for granted that the Colts do that. All right, this one comes from Portugal. A question from Alex. Whoa, Portugal. Never been. You? I've not. Right by Spain. I would go. Mistaken. I would yeah. Go. Shit. Yeah. Sign me up. Alex, if we go, let's get a beer. Cerveza. <laughs> or rather, they speak Portuguese, not yeah, Spanish. They... <laughs> that was horrible. Yeah. I thought Spain. I thought they. I don't know, man. Alex, I'm sorry. <laughs> Two years ago, Ballard brought back. I just got to shut up and speak English. <laughs> Two years ago, Ballard brought back the same team, and after the season, he said it was a mistake. Alex says, I like all the players that we've re-signed, but it feels like a mistake, is it? Is this a situation, is this situation slash players different? I'm conflicted. Well, it's got polar opposite from John. <laughs> you know, we got yeah. John above saying no need to panic, and Alex, I don't know if he's panicking, but he's, you know, asking questions. What I like about this offseason is this, Chris. The signings outside the building, there are a lot of 20, like mid to late 20 year olds that have started before in the NFL. So, you know, now you can argue how effective they've been as starters, but at least there's some experience there. Um, now, you're also banking a lot on your former second round picks. You know, we talked about Campbell. Obviously, Rocky Seen would fall in that category. Certainly, Kamoko Ture, Ben Banigou, whoever else there. Um, the one mistake I have is really edge rusher. That is the one big mistake I have. I could argue a little bit of wide out, but really edge rusher. And you guys know me. I'm all about raising that ceiling. And I just felt like the lack of activity in free agency, and now, boy, we've really kind of halted here in activity for free agency over the past few days. I thought that could have been raised a little higher. It's fair. This one's from Mitch. Who is worse, Ryan Grixon at drafting offensive linemen or Chris Ballard at drafting defensive linemen? Keep up the great work. Love the podcast. <laughs> Jeez, Mitch. Um, <laughs> yeah, boy, that O-line. No, it's funny going back to the Grixon drafts. Off the top of my head, Hugh Thornton third round, Colin Holmes fourth round, Jack Mehort second round. All three of those guys out of the NFL. You know, relatively quickly. I guess Muhort, you know, hung around a little bit longer. And mm-hmm. obviously the knee injuries killed him. Ryan Kelly, you know, worked. But you look at, like, the late round dudes. Joe Haig, Austin Blythe. He yeah. just signed to the Chiefs. Mm-hmm. Started with, with the Rams. Uh, Denzel Good starting. I mean, mm-hmm. like, it's funny to see those Blythe and Good, seventh rounders, if I'm not mistaken, and Haig, you know, a day three or those guys are holding on a lot longer than Thornton and Holmes and, and Muhort there. Um, and yeah, Ballard has you know, definitely struggled. But you look at Ballard and he waiver claimed Al Qadim Muhammad, and now he's been a pretty good find yeah. for you there. Yeah, it is interesting. Who was worse? Gregson an O lineman, Ballard a D lineman. Hmm. That's um Yeah, that's that's a good question. I, I, I don't know who I could go with there. Maybe because it contributed to luck getting hurt more. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. I mean everyone's like, Well, luck got hurt moving outside the pocket. Well, you don't think the hits that he took in the pocket had any wear and tear on him? Like, come on now. Yeah. It was not all just his scrambling. No, uh, you know, luck deserves some blame here, but Mitch, that's a wild question. This one's from Sawed Off SOB. Another great, I mean, I'm just... Wait, do it again? Sawed Off SOB. All right, this ought to be... <laughs> I can't wait to hear this one. T.Y. has openly said he wanted to play for one more contract before retiring, though I don't suspect he thought it would be for a one-year deal. Assuming he doesn't retire after the season, what level of production catches yards and touchdowns do you think he needs this year for Indy to bring him back in 2022? given that it seems Ursay had to force Ballard's hand a bit this year. Wow, that's a very normal, like, that's a question I would expect from, like, Bob or, like, <laughs> Susie, not from sawed-off SOB. The, Great. Yeah, he put the uh, the safety on and decided to ask the question. Yeah, I guess you're right there. Um, okay, so he wants to throw some numbers for Hilton next year. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole 17 games kind of I got to ingrain that into right. my brain a little bit here. I think he's got to play around 15. 
eight hundred ish yards. And that's with a full notion, like I'm expecting Pittman to be like eleven, twelve hundred. Yeah. Right. I, I think what's critical for me, Chris, is this. Big plays and big moments. You know, I if I were to tell you, give me the play of the year, I think you were in the building for this game. The play of the regular season for me is TY's catch down the seam against the Texans at home. Fourth quarter, just before a two minute warning. I think it was a th- it was either like a second and long or like a third down, and Rivers just rifles it down the seam, and Hilton finds that pocket and hauls it in mm-hmm. in, in some traffic. Those moments, you know, can he provide you that? Can he do it on the road? You know, I know we didn't see that in the playoff game. Um, I think that's really, really important there. Um, you know, December last year, he stepped up around that Houston game, the Raiders game. Raiders, yeah. he, I remember that touchdown catch he had against the Raiders. Hell, Rivers just threw it to him. Mm-hmm. And he was blanketed. And next thing you know, he catches it. Um, I'll say this about T.Y., and you guys know full well I've always been a big T.Y. guy. I mean, that dude turned down three years, $16 million from Baltimore to come here. Stay here, I should right. say. He loves the Colts. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's – now, maybe that's more of an indictment of what he thinks of Lamar Jackson as a thrower. But still, I mean, like – that that stands out to me. Um, it looks like he was thrown with Wentz last week. Did you see that? I did. Yeah. It looked like it was Pascal. Um, I thought maybe Doyle. I assume it was here in Indy. You know, with Hilton in town to sign the contract, and obviously Doyle lives here during the off season. And Pascal was in town for that. Um, so yeah, good to see Carson Wentz making the rounds and yes. throwing with guys and and whatnot. Question from Jim. If the Colts were able to draft Mac Jones, do you think they would? Mm. Boy, <laughs> that's a hot one. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you think he means at 21? I think, yeah. I think he's saying okay. if Mac Jones falls to 21, do you go ahead and take Boy. a quarterback? I hope Mac's not in the green room. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't think so, man. I, I will say this. Reich loves those QBs that can process. And it seems like that's Mac's greatest mm-hmm. strength. Boy, it's crazy, man, how Mac Jones is. I think I mentioned this before on a podcast. To me, Chris, he's the most fa- – him and Trey Lance are so fascinating as prospects for so many different reasons. Yeah. Mac Jones played with video game characters mm-hmm. around him. Does that mean he sucks? Like, no, I mean, it doesn't mean he sucks. I mean, it means it's just difficult to evaluate him. And then Trey Lance, you know, barely threw the ball 20 times in a game and – Barely played football over the last year or so, and yeah, that's um, I I, I don't think so, Jim. I don't, you know, I I do feel like the Colts think they're a little bit more win now, and that would not be a win now move. Yeah, I always find it interesting around this time of year, especially after the combine and pro days. Nothing's really happening yet in mock drafts. For whatever reason, people just start shifting, and it's like. Why is this guy climbing? Why is this guy falling? I don't, I don't understand the the hearsay that that goes on with some of those things. So it's kind of fun to then see our you know front offices leaking things. Are they playing right. the mind games with other front offices of oh, we're going to take this guy? We're not smoke gonna... screen central. I love it. And you know, Chris and I think the combine, the guys are coming in for medicals here pretty soon. Um, the, the the top flight guys. It's just unusual off season from like I see these pro day numbers and I'm like, that's a quick stopwatch mm-hmm. at a lot of these pro days. So are you comparing those to your normal history number, historical numbers that you go off of? Yeah. For guys that okay, guys that test like this, they hit ninety percent of the time. Those things you didn't get the one on one time at the combine. Mm-hmm. Um, you probably just don't get in general as much one on one time. Uh, certainly in the fall in Magaha. And DeReese and that with the next pick kind of outlined that as well. Uh, one thing I do want to go back on Hilton really quick, Chris. Um, SOB mentioned, I can't believe I just referenced to someone as that's their <laughs> name. Sorry. Um, like Ursay kind of forced Ballard's hand a little bit there. I, I forget exactly what the phraseology was. I don't know if I mentioned this on last week's podcast, but I'm curious. Ursay said one year, 10 million. Let's just say Ballard was more of one year, I don't know, six million or seven million. Is that Ballard saying we don't think T.Y. Hilton is long no longer is he at that level 
So that means we value our depth chart. We look at our depth chart differently. We see Hilton in a scaled back role. Now, Devil's Advocate will say, well, the Colts didn't do anything else at wideout in the offseason. So clearly they still value Hilton at some level. But I'm just curious that. Like, and now all of a sudden I'm trying to talk myself into wideout being an earlier draft pick. Mm-hmm. Again, if Ballard, who builds the roster, and Reich, who's an, and who knows where, where Reich kind of fell on the money value standpoint, he probably doesn't care. He's just probably like, just, <laughs> yeah, just find me, me the 46 on game day and we'll go. Um, but I think that's something. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's something I think just to keep in mind of where does wide out fall. Now, again, we didn't see anything in free agency. We'll see what happens in three weeks. Um, but all good things, I think, just to keep keep uh, keep in mind. Here's a fun one from Arcadius. Of all the draft picks that you can remember for the Colts between the Polian, Grixon, and Ballard eras. Oh, man, that goes back. Uh huh. I remember the draft was all on a Saturday. It took forever. Yeah, forever. What player were you most surprised about being a bust, and also what player were you most surprised about that became a gym? Yeah, they got to go watch Ryan Bowen at Heartland Crossing one time play golf, and it was freezing. I'm like, dude, let me just post up in the snack shop, <laughs> and I'll watch golf. Or I, sh- not the draft. Golf. I'll watch the draft. I, I, I need a Kuiper's hair is looking good. Let's go. <laughs> um, Wow. Where can I mean, where'd even begin, Chris? You know, I, I always thought Moncrief would turn into something. To talk about Gregson era. Mm-hmm. I mean, hell, I don't even know where he's at. Houston? He's been he's bounced, he's bounced to so everywhere. many teams. You know, I'll say Braden Smith, Julian Blackman, how quickly. Different position for Braden. Obviously, Blackman, the ACL. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I thought Quincy Wilson would turn into something. I know he was super young. You know, when he was drafted, so I always was kind of like, yeah. you know, you can be paid. I thought he was like 20 maybe when he was drafted. Um, and he was right around that time we talked about the the talent, right around that time where everyone's like, look how long Richard Sherman is in these big corners, yeah, and was yeah, like, yeah, 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 this guy's intriguing. Yeah, frame was not an issue, or isn't an issue for Quincy. <laughs> yeah, you go back to the Grigs and stuff a little bit earlier. I mean, Denzel Good, Austin Blythe. I thought, remember the guy that crashed the golf cart, um, David Perry? Yes. You remember that name? Mm-hmm. Got a stocky guy out of Stanford. I thought he'd plug up some holes for a few years. I don't know what happened to him here. The guy I liked who I thought had a nice preseason was um oh, I can picture him, the little guy, so happy. Josh Robinson from Mississippi State is running back. Day three running yes, back. Yes, yep. I thought he'd be um you know, just one of those day three running backs that would have a nice rookie contract and um boy, Pullian era. Yeah, I mean I mean, Mathis just right, and Bethay. I mm-hmm. mean, both those guys early for Bethay. I mean, that was Super Bowl year, you know. Cato June, I think, is another late pick. I thought Tony Hugo would turn into something. You know, the polling drafts had a lot of misses early, late, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. The yeah. early picks late in his tenure. But, dude, if you look at, like, I know all Colts fans know these names, but literally go back and look at the drafts. Hell, on. I'm just going to pull it up. Okay. From, like, 99 to, like, I don't know, probably Joseph Adai. Mm-hmm. It was just a constant, constant home run in round one. And, like, again, don't take that for granted, people. It doesn't happen like that. Um. All right. 98, Peyton. 99, Edge. Uh, 2000, Rob Morris. God bless him, but I guess he did help on that Super Bowl team. Reggie Wayne, 30th overall. Dwight Freeney, 11th overall. 03, Dallas Clark. 04, Bob Sanders. <laughs> 05, Marlon Jackson. 06, Joseph Adai. I mean, we're talking 30th overall, 29th overall, 44th overall, 24th overall. Freeney at 11 was met with some skepticism. Uh, Reggie Wayne at 30, you know. You know, even Edge, that, that pick was met with skepticism. Like, oh, my God. And we wonder why that was the greatest decade regular season football in NFL history. I did not realize Robin Morris was a first-round pick for us. The pride of BYU, Bobby I mean, Morris. great special teams. I felt like he was in on every special teams tackle, but yeah, did not realize. He was old when he got pick. drafted. He was born in 75 so that means he was 25 when he was drafted. That's something you never see nowadays. Yeah. You know, you always hear about that NBA age. NBA a lot more, but I think in the NFL it's starting to creep in. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, those Pullian picks, dude. Hit, hit them when they counted. Oh, my for God. For sure. Incredible. All right, a question comes from the Joker. I've been thinking, when people talk about T.Y. Hilton, especially as of recent, we talk about him not being elite since he led the league in receiving in t- receiving yards in 2016. Just how special was the chemistry between him and Luck? Because it felt like they could read each other's minds almost every play. If they don't get injured like they did, especially Luck, and he, especially Luck, and he plays at least through T.Y.'s career, could they have potentially been a top ten, maybe top five wide receiver quarterback duo of all time? Man. Boy, this is a tearjerker almost here. You hear two wise comments about Andrew? Mm-hmm. You know, he's making me want to retire. He's so happy. Um, yeah, there's just an innate nature to that relationship, Chris, on and off the field that, that I think is just, you know, they were so, so close. And, and they just got it. And, you know, what's it, impressive, I don't think T.Y., I know, I mean, Andrew, well, you know, Stanford was on the quarter system, so he didn't get here as quickly as you would like him to. Yeah. And T.Y. was a little bit banged up. He missed his first game, that game in Chicago, Jarrell Freeman pick six game. Um, but, man, they got on the same page so quickly. And I, I know I've told the story before, but it's it's the luck sitting down with Reich when he was hired. Be like, it might not be picture perfect. Exactly how you draw it up for T.Y., but he gets it done. He knows where, and I know where he's going to be, mm-hmm. and that's all that matters. So, yes, as a as crazy as that might sound, Luck Hilton combo easily could have been top ten, easily could have been top five. Uh, I don't know about easily top five, but yes, it could have been top five. Like I, I think back to that twenty eighteen season, I think it was when you close the game in Houston with those two just making a couple big throws. Mm-hmm. Like you think it's four minute offense, you think it's ground and pound, blah blah blah. Here comes Marlon Mack. No. It's these two closing that game. And, um, yeah, special, 12-13. Cue up the YouTube Luck to Hilton highlights. Four more left for Twitter questions. This one comes from Dad Talks. Hey, KB, hope all is well. I have two questions. First one, what do you think Ballard does with the pick at 21? Does he use it at less tackle, edge rush, or trade it back to get more picks? Yeah, that I mean, that's hard to say, man, until the board starts falling. Mm-hmm. I know that's, that's a cliche answer. I think you want to stay in round one, though. I do think that's that's important. And now number two, off of the topic of, of Colts, with spring and summer approaching, what is your go-to grill food? Oh, nice. Well, shit. I mean, the grill's been out, man. We It's been some nice weather. Mm-hmm. Um, shout out to Fisher Farms down in Jasper. Chris and Kremp, my, uh, my sister-in-law, the pride of Jasper down there. They um, We were talking about them on uh, – JMV and they and they sent some meats up to the Bowen household. We had an awesome pork chop from there, um, a nice fillet as well. They had dude these burgers for the size hell they they're as big as Rosie. <laughs> um, we threw those on there. So um, yeah, I'm, I mean I would say any I, I I'm a sucker for steak. Obviously you can get a little bit pricey there, but um, that that would be my go to. My wife loves to throw the veggies on the grill as well. So I was gonna ask if you were a grill veggie person. Yeah, we are. Sprinkle those in there. Um So yeah, I mean it's boy, it's perfect season for that. Yes, it is. Gosh. Now, start starting to get to that time where you're gonna start Saturdays smelling people cutting the grass, yeah. the grill oh, yeah. f- across the street. I gotta get going. the lawn out. I got I, I gotta get the mower out now that you say that. It, it's due. That back yeah, it's getting British open type length in the backyard. So yeah. I gotta get that out. Rosie liked grass. Some ba- like uh, my niece this weekend. They were like, kind of feeling it out. Like I don't know if I like this. Yeah, I, I think we're there. We did a um, we did a little picnic over at Butler. Mm-hmm. She kind of liked that. Um, tried to get in the Easter egg hunt action this weekend, and a little bit more of like, should I eat the grass? Should I just look <laughs> at it? Yeah. We, we were a little bit more in the curiosity stage because you know she was born in June, so it's not like she really saw grass yeah. or played in the grass. So. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't, you know, we'll probably keep her away from smoking the grass for, for, you know, <laughs> hopefully a, a good amount of time here. But, um, but yeah, she, um, she, hey, we're going to be playing in the grass though. There you go. Well, we, hey, we got basketball going in the backyard. Dad's got to get up some free throws. I like we it. We got have Rosie out there motoring around. This one's from Z Palm KB. Do you think Ballard's approach to free agency would have changed with Phillip Rivers or Andrew Luck at quarterback? 
we'd have more certainty at the position, so Ballard might have been more aggressive. That's interesting. Um, that's interesting. I really don't think so. Is this the Zach that I saw at um, Wolfie's on Saturday? This might be. Could be. Yeah, we had a good, we had a nice, nice crowd there. You've been busy all March. Been busy, man. It, it's been, um, it's been a good busy though. Mm-hmm. It's nice to have that back. Um, to be honest, I really don't think so. I think Ballard is so steadfast in his building and his philosophy. Like I don't. Now the contract situations would have looked much different. You know, Rivers on the one year versus Luck. You know, he still would be on this current contract, but right. do an extension. Um. But to your point, you know me, Chris, I'm a believer in just building has to evolve. So I do think I would have some slight tweaks, but I really don't know if Ballard would have. Now, contractually, he might have been forced to do some things differently. This question's from Fisher. I know Chris Ballard is one of the best GMs in the league when it comes to hitting on draft picks, but do you think he should focus more on positions of value and goes on to mention quarterback, edge, wide receiver, offensive tackle? Well, I mean, I, I think he has. I mean, edge and wide out, he's definitely drafted early. Offensive tackle, there really hasn't been the need to draft early until right now. And then quarterback, you know, I don't need to get into all that. So, yeah, I, I again, you've kind of been settled at those spots, Chris. Now, edge, not really. Um, but he's drafted, you know, early mm-hmm. there, second and third rounders. So. I mean, they haven't had a first round. They haven't used a first round pick, I should say, since Quentin Nelson. Yeah, you know, he traded out of the first round in the last two years. So, I guess you defined, you know, where that level of focus should be. But I mean, those are certainly big needs moving forward when we talk about long term. Well, it wouldn't be a Kevin's Corner podcast without a Notre Dame question thrown in here. Oh, that sounds like a bitter <laughs> Tennessee fan if I've ever heard one. Come on. So we're gonna wrap it up with a question from Thomas. Says I hate sounding like an expert, but I legit think we need to invest some draft capital into tight end, as you mentioned as well, Kevin, in the fourth round. How do you feel about drafting Ben? And I'm going to let you go ahead and pronounce his name from Notre Dame. Oh, he got the hands and the route running, and he seems like a pass catching threat at tight end. Yeah, um, Ben Skoranek, out of Fort Wayne. Shout out to Above Ground Pools in Fort Wayne. Um. Yeah, he really had a nice – he did the graduate thing, the Northwestern, over to Notre Dame. He, he was a good player for Notre Dame this year. Yeah, I, Thomas, like stuff like this, it just doesn't happen that often in the NFL. Like I don't know of a lot of great – or I should say quantity of wideouts that like make a position change to tight end. I feel like it's much more of a um, college, you know, high school to college thing. Obviously, body types are kind of still growing in that time. So I, I get the question, but I just – no, probably not. Um, now, just chronic, if you want to stay around in the NFL, I don't know, put on 20 pounds, and maybe that's that's the route that you're going to have to go. But I feel like it's a little bit more of just kind of a, a little bit fantasy type of idea. I, I don't think it's the dumbest question by any means, but it, it's interesting why we just don't see that more often. All right, that rounds out all of the Twitter questions for this edition of Kevin's Corner. Awesome. Um, all right, people, we'll be back again every week until the draft. I Week of the draft, Chris, I think we just go with Beers with Bowen. Okay. You know, Wednesday night, Beers with Bowen. That'll be live on YouTube. Um, that's where you can find us. Awesome interaction on there. Hopefully have some prizes to give away that night. We'll have a little trivia action as well. 8 p.m., mark that in your calendar, April 28th. Head to Prop Swap this weekend, find some great masters. Uh, bets that uh, you can sell or buy over there. I will be on the couch. Gosh, man. This is where I got to preface with Maddie this week. I'm like, let us get through this weekend, and then I <laughs> promise you my sport uh, uh, obsession. I don't know. I guess you need to admit the problem first, so it's probably glad I said that. It will wane a bit. A bit. I mean, a bit. Yeah. I'm not going to go Let's, full like it's going right. to you know, stop, but it'll lessen, I should say. Um all right, man. How, your Braves got off to a good start. I haven't. Seen they did not. They got swept by the Phillies, Ooh. so they dropped three games early on. So it's okay. always it's always tough out of the gate. And then I saw Castellanos for your, for your Reds yeah. got suspended over yeah, just a bullshit. dumb incident. I yeah, mean, come on, just, come on, in Major League Baseball. Yeah, after game one, I thought the Reds would go own one sixty two or however many <laughs> they're playing this year. Uh, now I'm like they're going to win the pennant. Yeah, that was one of uh, with the tipsy picks. We went ahead and 
that game where like it's going to be under seven. You know, snowing in Cincinnati. Dude, I did under as well. And then check the box score. I'm like, uh, yeah. St. Louis has six in the first. That's right. great. Uh, okay. no. Yeah, don't remind me. Yeah, <laughs> and I guess yeah, that, we all, we both had financial stake in it. So yeah. He's Chris Presley. I'm Kevin Bowen. Hope you all had a great March Madness, great Easter weekend with the fam. Uh, We will talk to you guys next week.